board members, I would like to uh, thank the staff for selecting uh, Crom to represent the pre-stressed concrete tank builders. Uh, we would be one company that would bid on this project, assuming that, that it, uh, everything goes forward. Um, as Mr. Fisher alluded to, it's a big investment, a big asset. Um, and I think the staff have done a great job looking at all the options. Um, being in this industry as long as I have, I, there is no other way to store that volume of water for less money than a pre-stressed concrete tank. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tanks um, briefly, and then we'll open it for questions if, if I don't cover something or you all would like to see something again. Uh, I live in Chattanooga, uh, not too far from here. It's about four and a half hours away. Crom has been uh, able to build a few tanks in the area, some for uh, the Frankfurt Power Board already. This one's actually for at the wastewater treatment plant, um, not far from downtown here. Um, this is one of two fire protection tanks um, that we built for the Woodford Reserve Distillery, just down the road in Midway. This is a water storage tank uh, owned by the plant board. I believe you all refer to that as the Han tank out there. I believe that tank's been out there since about 92, I'm not mistaken. How, how big is that tank? The one I that Han. is a three million gallon tank. Okay. And everyone has probably seen this structure. That's uh, a unique structure. It's an all concrete, pre-stressed, elevated water storage tank. And where is this one? That one is uh, long, I believe it's 127 on the way to her sales. Oh, okay. Yeah, on, on the right there. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. Okay. Yeah. 60. How about 60? Gotcha. Um, the <laughs> technology that goes into what we do has been around for a long time. Um, the cement gun, called gunite, uh, has turned into wet mix shotcrete. That is what the structure is made out of, the walls, that is. Um, the other magic that's involved is pre-stressing, where we take that concrete and we put it into a lot of compression. That allows it to work in tension because it's been pre-compressed, if you will. Um, the founder of our company was one of the people that first put those two technologies together um, to solve the water storage problem with a real efficient design. And uh, he helped found the Crom Corporation in 1953. So, We've basically been building the, the same structures we build today for uh, 60 plus years now, 65 years. Um, the types of tanks that we build are governed by certain standards. The AWWA D110 and the ACI 372 documents uh, most closely apply. And there's been, this slide says 9,000. We're probably approaching 10,000 tanks built to this standard. Of those, Crom's built over 4,200 of them. Um, so we are the company that has built the most of these kinds of tanks. And we still have tanks that have been in service since 1955. I frequently get asked, how long will they last? We're very confident they'll last 50 years. Um, those are actually wastewater tanks, so it's a, more of a harsh service. Um, and they're still doing fine. Why pre-stress concrete tanks? Why did the staff look at this option? Um, there are lots of reasons, but I will highlight these. Concrete's very low maintenance. Uh, unlike a steel tank that's exposed to the elements, it doesn't rust. Uh, but steel's great at holding water. So our tank actually has an embedded steel shell, and then it has shotcrete on both sides. And the efficient design is not only a competitive cost, but like I mentioned, at this volume, uh, pre-stressed concrete is, is the lowest cost option to store seven million gallons. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the real basic anatomy of a tank. You've got the floor, of course, the walls, and then the cover or the roof on this. Uh, the roof option is really what we want to focus on. And you've got a free span concrete dome. You've got a metal dome. I have one picture of that. Or you can do a flat roof with columns that support it. It's like an elevated slab. So this is a picture of a floor being cast. We prefer to cast the floors all at once. They are typical cast concrete, like you would see building a road or the how you know the floor of your house, except that it's very highly reinforced because it has to hold water. And so the cracks that will form have to stay super small so that they don't leak. Next, the wall is 
built and a key part of the way we do a tank is how we connect this wall to the floor. Pre-stressed concrete is elastic. Uh, if, you, if you all have ever been sitting on an overpass and a big truck drives by going the other way and your car bounces up and down, that's a pre-stressed concrete beam flexing. So the, the walls of these tanks move as well. So how do you have concrete moving on concrete and keep it watertight? It's kind of tricky. So that's what you see in this water stop here. There is a shell, the steel shell I mentioned is epoxy sealed to a water stop that is allowed to move. So that's, that's how we make it watertight. This is just another picture. The steel shell is made of sheets and each of those sheets are also epoxy sealed together. That's what this photo is showing. And that is just a 3D photograph of the wall model that you may have seen when you walked in back by the sign in. Just shows the anatomy of the wall. But you can see there, you've got the steel shell with concrete on both sides and then the wires that do the work. <coughs> so with our roof options, uh, I alluded to a free span dome made out of metal. This is made out of aluminum. These are called geodesic domes. Um, when the staff considered this, they didn't feel that this was gonna be an option aesthetically. It's, it's fairly industrial looking. And at the diameter that we're looking at for this tank, this would be very expensive, more than a concrete cover. So next we have concrete tops. And there's three options here. The one in the top left corner is, is our standard um, dome that we build. It's called a one-tenth rise. That basically has to do with the curvature of the dome. Um, as we mentioned, we can do a flat roof that's a column supported, basically deck. Um, or we can do a lower rise dome, which is, it's fabricated and constructed the same way the tenth rise is, but because it's so flat, it has to be thicker uh, and with a lot more pre-stressing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Is the sixteenth the lowest it you is. can get down without? especially at this diameter. It's, it's getting very flat. This photograph is of a four million gallon tank with a 16th rise, and it was already increasing the thickness of that dome. I'll give you some more statistics on the differences in the 10th rise and the 16th. So this is a rendering um, provided by Strand of the actual site that we're considering, and that is a 1 10th rise dome kind of superimposed in there. Um, like I said, 99% of the covered tanks that we have built have been built with one-tenth rise domes. So there's exceptions, but most of the time that's, that's what you see. Um, and this picture actually still shows the wall of the existing north tank, just for reference? or It does. Um, I believe... Adam, I will let you speak to that. Just for mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I believe the plan is for the backfill that's on the existing structure to go back in place mm -hmm. so that, it, that the appearance changes as little as possible. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ruby. Um, I'll toggle back and forth here. I try to get these in the exact same spot. So that's a 1 16th rise rendering, and I'm going back and forth. That's 1 10th, back to 1 16th, 1 10th, 1 16th. You can see it drops the profile, especially from the angle that we're at. It, you really don't, it, it does drop it some. However, there is a, a cost for that. Um, it's about a half a million dollars more to do the 16th rise. Why? So the thickness of the dome on a 1 10th rise is three and a half inches for buckling. When we go to the 16th, it goes to almost eight inches. So once we get above six inches, now there's two mats of steel in the dome. Uh, in addition to that, the formwork and the shoring that has to hold up that additional weight is more, it's just more pieces to handle. I'll have a picture of that, what that looks like. And then the wire that we wrap in the dome band, we have to do many more layers because there's a lot more thrust of that dome coming down. Sir, what's the difference in height between the 110th and 116th? Is there so this, we're, we're talking about a 185 foot diameter tank. So the rise on a 10th rise dome is 185 over 10, rough numbers, and the rise for the 16th rise dome is 185 over 16. So I believe that works out to seven, seven, feet. seven feet. So the 116 scale will be seven feet, the roof, uh, the apex of the roof will be seven feet lower. Thank you. Yes, sir. Th 
this is a photograph um, of the formwork that is holding up the cast concrete before we pre-stress it. Once we put the pre-stressing on, the dome actually rises up off the formwork and then we can take the formwork down. But you can see how many pieces uh, there are and when you over double the thickness of the uh, concrete that you're supporting, these towers get closer together, the lumber gets heavier, everything gets beefier. So um, that's just a picture of how much work goes <laughs> underneath there. And this is a rendering of if we were to do a column supported flat roof. One of the biggest differences with a flat roof is you could be looking at a 16 inch thick deck because it, it's not supported by the wall, it's supported by columns and you have to design it as a beam, if you will, between columns. So it's very thick. Uh, in addition to that, it doesn't have that head space um, that you get with the uh, with the dome, so you have to actually increase the wall height to, to give some freeboard. So when you have the freeboard plus the, uh, the additional thickness, you're adding about two feet to the visible wall height. So even though the, the roof is flat, your, your wall gets taller. Um, and from this perspective, uh, we can flip back and forth if you guys would like it. It's noticeable, that additional wall height. Uh, the cost, as I said, a lot more concrete. Uh, I got a picture of all the columns inside. The formwork's even heavier. Uh, it's about $1.75 million more than a 10th rise dome. So from the inside, this is what a free span dome looks like. Uh, very clean, open, minimal surfaces for the water to touch, uh, for to maintain, to clean in the future. And this is what the inside of a flat roof column supported deck would look like. Um, if in the future you needed to get in there and inspect or clean, um, the divers are going to have umbilicals or the ROVs, the remote control vehicles have umbilicals. It's tricky getting them in and out of columns without getting them tangled. Uh, and as we mentioned, there's, it's a more complicated design um, with the deck. You've got stresses that are going to invert, moments that get taller and smaller, whereas a shell is a nice even compression all over. Um, I had uh, one of the staff look at all of the tanks we've built and I, I wanted to know okay, how many tanks have we built with a roof on them and out of 4,200, 3,100 have been built with covers and out of those how many had flat roofs and it was 24. So most of the time it, it's going to be a dome, it's just it's more efficient. And with regard to safety, uh, obviously this new structure is replacing a very old structure. So it will be designed to the latest codes. Uh, ASCE 7 dictates what we look at for wind conditions and for seismic accelerations, earthquakes. So in this area, we would be designing to 120 mile an hour wind speed uh, and seismic accelerations that you typically see in a uh, magnitude seven to eight earthquake. Um, I've got a few slides here of, of how tanks integrate into residential areas. Um, I think these speak to the comfort level that designers through the years have had putting big storage tanks near where folks live. Um, tanks, you usually don't get calls about loud parties or barking dogs. They, they make fairly good neighbors from that, that, from that point of view. But the lighter colors, I, I would say, if you, you don't have to paint the tank, but if you were, Pick a house color. Uh, that's, that typically makes them, that softens them a little bit and makes them look uh, as nice as they can. Obviously, these photos I selected, that they're very close proximity, um, as you can see, to the homes. But uh, can't be done. And that's, uh, I'll open it for questions. Anyone? Yeah, I had a couple. Um, you said that you've been making the same stress con concrete design for about 60 years. Have you looked at any other alternatives, um, fiberglass or I anything that's out there? We have faced lots of competition through the years. Oh. That's a very good question. And it's not to say that there haven't been improvements in what we do. Uh, I alluded to the original tanks were built with gunite and we now use a, a wet mix that has to do with how you apply the shot material on the tank. Mm -hmm. We used to shotcrete the domes, now we cast the domes. So through the years there have been a lot of improvements, but the, the basic concept of a steel shell, shotcrete, wires doing the work, that has not changed. Okay. 
And then of the three different types of roofs, flat or the one tenth, one sixteenth, do they have different life expectancies? Would you expect them all to last the same around 50 years or? If, I think so, I think so. The, you would, when you go inside of a three span dome, mm -hmm. I think the inspection's a bit easier because like I said, you have a lot less surface area to inspect and look at. Uh, when you have a column supported roof and you have a bit higher stresses where that slab passes over that column because it's holding up a real big square of concrete need to pay a little bit more attention, um, but, if, but if properly inspected and maintained, I, I would say they would have similar lives. Yes. In between the one tenth and one sixteenth? No difference. Okay. Following up on what Anne Marie, in terms of just ongoing, not just lifespan, but in terms of ongoing maintenance, is there a difference between the flat roof and the, uh, the dome? With Things that can go wrong, regular maintenance that needs to be done. And right. I think the big difference is they're both concrete. So you would need to do the same inspections on each. There's a, a little more tedious inspection on the columns just because of you saw all of the uh, kind of nooks and crannies that the column capitals and all create. There we are, put that back up there. But when you're talking about maintaining the tank proper, the water holding structure, it's much more difficult to clean and inspect when you're inside the tank getting the sediment and silt out and from time to time you have to do that. The columns are just furniture in the way, you know, that you have to work around and, you know, make sure you get everything in all these little angular spaces here and, and things like that. So it would, it would be, if you had someone give you a price to clean a column supported tank out versus a dome covered tank, this was going to cost more, for sure. Anything else? And, well, one other thing. In what instances do people go with a flat roof? You know, you said there are the 24. So, about 10 of the 24 we built are a special service tank that has an, an aerator on top, and it's actually a self-washing where the water is allowed to hit the bottom of the dome. It's, it's in lieu of coating the inside of the tank to protect the concrete from gases, oh. from corrosion gases. That's, we built about 10 for that reason. We built a few where they wanted to put it underground, um, but I think those are wastewater tanks. I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can do that with a, with a potable water tank. Um, and then the others, we did several over in the Middle East, and they wanted to put pebbles on top. Uh, it was actually one of those photos. Um, they had a different idea. So you can't see this, but that's pebbles by that road of the photo in the middle, and the same aggregate was on the roofs to hide them from the air. So they didn't really oh, count. It's like surveillance. To the Middle East, yeah. Surveillance, okay. <laughs> right. So camouflage. Right, so you know, really high loads, you want to put it underground, um, kind of want to make them go away or for other process reasons. Okay, What's, thank you. Um, in terms of this site, Working on it, I mean, is it is this site considered a pretty tight constraints in terms of to work in and build something, or is this, is you, I mean, it's not an open space that, I mean, obviously you're going to have to work around existing, don't, I mean, what's your experience in doing that? Right, we've walked the site. Uh, I have built tanks much, much closer to homes and structures than this one. Um, this is not one, when I look at that site, that I'm going to have to put a lot of contingencies on for, you know, close neighbors and that sort of thing compared to others. Uh, we're diligent about the way that we, you know, protect everything. Mm -hmm. um, we pay attention to weather conditions and wind conditions. Um, so there may be times at which we don't proceed with work if we think that it could you know, bother the neighbors. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, oh my goodness, this is going to be Thank you. Very helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Very informative.